Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, we're starting a minute late here. We will uh, we'll call uh, public safety to order here at 1232. Thank you all for being here. Um, and we will kick it off today uh, with an update uh, from the Grand Rapids Police Department on monthly crime statistics and a partnership with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, D.C. Rogers, welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to commissioners and the Public Safety Committee. I would like to introduce, first off, our new uh, Chief of Staff, Matt Weibel, and let him uh, give a little introduction to himself. Today is his second day, so he's, uh, he's learning, he's taking it all in. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Uh, commissioners, members of the committee, city manager, uh, my name is Matt Weibel. Um, have been in public service my entire career, spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., was born in Grand Rapids. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be home in Grand Rapids. Uh, all my family is still here, uh, ecstatic to be serving the city of Grand Rapids. So I want to thank the city manager and the police department for uh, having the, the trust in me to, to fill this role, and I'm looking forward to what's to come. Thank you. Welcome home. Thank you. Okay, we're just going to um, cover some of the monthly or the monthly stats that we do. So again, this is all year-to-date information. So the January 1st through June 13th homicides, we are currently at nine um, this year in 2023. Uh, for aggravated assaults and auto theft data, again, it is displayed. And just to remind everybody that in 20 of, or 2022, late summer and fall, was when the uptick, uptick of the auto thefts started happening with the Kia boys and such. Um, national numbers have also increased all the way across, so it's not unique to Grand Rapids, but we do see that uh, trend continuing into the beginning of 2023. Uh, robbery remains pretty consistent with 75 in 2023. For Grand Rapids efforts, again, to show um, cleared homicides, the national average is 55%. We, again, for 2021 and 2022 are above average. And this also, um, just to, I guess, explain, we're always continuously still working these cases through sound observer tips, through investigative leads. None of these, I mean, our, our hope is to increase that percentage. Um, but again, they're all continuously being worked on. For this year, for 2023, we've again, we've had um, nine murders. Four of those are closed by arrest or prosecution, with several more that are in different stages of investigation and um, hopefully will be closed soon. Year to date, we've had 168 illegal possessed firearms recovered. Um, that is the average of one plus illegally possessed guns that are recovered every day. And just to note that, that we've had no um, lethal force issues or incidents this year for 2023. And again, that's recovering 168 weapons year to date this year. Uh, excited about a program um, that the U.S. Attorney's Office um, announced, including everybody in Michigan. Again, it's called Safe Summer 2023 Program. Uh, knowing nationwide, again, not um, anything specific to the city of Grand Rapids, but there's usually an uptick in violence and gun-related crimes in the warmer months. Uh, the U.S. Attorney has, again, rolled out this program, and it is, they're looking at all cases for anybody who has a gun in which ballistic Ballistics can show that it was involved in a crime. So again, it's crime gun cases. Um, even if we get something locally, we will investigate it, and then we can refer it to the U.S. Attorney or work with them during the investigation. And between the state's prosecution office and the U.S. Attorney General, they will discuss who might be picking up the cases for charges um, for the long run. And this is just an example. I know it's kind of small, but I'll try to explain. This is an example of a homicide that happened in December of 2020. Um, we had an incident where a, a young man was killed in December of 2020. But this goes to show that the gun on top that he was in possession with at the end to the right when the homicide occurred in December had been used at all those different incidents. So each box represents an incident starting on the left on October 8th, and it goes through October 8th, October 18, October 19, October 21st, and, and therefore. Um, so it's very interesting. What we do is at any crime scene, whether it's a shot's fired or if somebody's injured or any, any, any case or incident scene that would have like casings or projectiles that we're able to, to um, 
collect and then put it in through the system through MSP, through Niobin, and get results back. They're able to show and trace that those guns were used in several different locations and in several incidents. So once we are able to obtain this information, and as, I don't know if you can see on here, but there's different detective names on each one, because when you get the case, you don't know for sure if they're related, right? So they assign them out to the different um, investigators, and as that information comes back, they're then able to tie them together. And then the person, um, for example here, Calvin Stewart was the one that ended up with the gun, um, was the person that committed the murder and is now serving life in prison. But they're able to go back and do um, a lot of historical investigation then to try to tie him back to all the other incidents um, in which the weapon was used. We understand that oftentimes that the weapon might change hands, um, but this is a perfect example of what the U.S. Attorney is looking at in a case that we are hoping um, to be able to develop for them, for them to uh, be able to take to prosecution. Any questions or concerns? Colleagues, any questions uh, for Deputy Chief Rogers? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the um, for the report, DC. Um, back on, I think it's the fourth page around the illegally possessed firearms that were recovered. Um, do you have a breakdown of like, not that I'm super familiar with the different types of firearms, but obviously, um, I know that there are different kinds, and obvious, you know, I, the other map shows that piece. But is there a disaggregation about what kind of types of firearms those are? I don't have that with me today, but okay. in our record management system, we are um, when the evidence is put in, they're able to say whether it's a handgun or a mm -hmm. um, shotgun, those type of things. But okay. oftentimes, we'll get calls to like homes. We just had an incident the other day where somebody's like, "Hey, um, somebody in my family passed away. We'd like you to come take these guns." None of those guns are counted in these numbers. Okay. These are only ones in which illegally um, obtained from people on the road. We didn't want to do anything where we, we're not putting in numbers of safekeeping or, hey, come and take this gun. It's mm -hmm. just sitting here, those type of things. And then uh, a follow-up to that, since we know, so not anything like a family member coming, but um, could we also break down when they are retrieved, like maybe if... I'm guessing it's mostly happening in cars because that's some of the communication that we've gotten before. Would it be possible to disaggregate like the age of those um, occupants in cars or um, to get at some of that pieces as we continue to have this conversation about young people in particular having access to these firearms? Sure. Oh, no, you don't have it today. But, yes. Yep. Um, it could be discussed definitely okay. with our, um, our record management system. We're actually in the process of creating it and fine-tuning mm -hmm. it um, to roll out a new version of it before this one okay. is outdated. So we are discussing... Um, ability to earmark things within that system. And just for an example, the the case that's on the, the following, the last page, mm -hmm. that gentleman, the suspect, um, that night after um, committing the homicide, a description was put out of the vehicle. Our officers saw the vehicle. It um, eluded us and into a pursuit. Um, the vehicle crashed, and there was two illegal firearms in that car, one of them being the murder weapon and another um, firearm. So oftentimes um, with these, like the Kia mm -hmm. thing with the stolen cars, um, Oftentimes things are used together within crimes, like they might steal a car to then go do a robbery to then have the guns, you know, that kind of stuff. So, it, um, yes, you're right. Oftentimes they kind of go in a package. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Commissioner Moody. Yep. Thank you, D.C. Rogers. I just want to thank you for uh, this report because especially when it comes to declared homicides, we never, uh, the community never hears uh, that certain homicides have been cleared. Sure. So f to have uh, nine homicides in 2023 and have at least four of them already cleared, I, th I think that's a plus for our, our, our city, and it shows that our uh, department is doing everything it can to make sure these cases get solved. Uh, but it's important that we see this, uh, but I just want to make sure how do we get the um, um, access to the community unless we do it as commissioners to let the community know that Half of these homicides for 23 have been cleared already. And we truly believe that all of them could be cleared with community support mm -hmm. and um, 
really coming forward and, and what they see happening, um, unfortunately, in their communities. So um, that is one struggle with with um, the police that I do feel like, hopefully, with further trust and cooperation that we can really, I would like to be able to put a nine up there right now on that board. And um, our last one with the um, young mom that was just murdered downtown, um, north of Wealthy. We just made an arrest with that gentleman after hours of work, and um, he was in a neighboring state, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, Commissioner Conn, in, in the past, have we ever had uh, reports like this for public safety? I think when I came on, I don't remember hearing that. They, we always did have the clear, what was clear and what was not clear. Okay. Yeah, that's been something I think the chief and, and deputy chiefs have been trying to, you know, we haven't had an update like this in a while because we've been focused on some uh, some other uh, topics of conversation. But I know that in the uh, in a sense, the arrival of, of Chief Winstrom is something we've continued to try to talk about. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? Anyone from? Uh, yes, go ahead. For the auto thefts, are those still primarily like Kias and related to that vulnerability, or is that uptick? coming from somewhere it like is it still just riding the tail end of what was started last summer yes I believe so I have no reason to believe otherwise I haven't looked at, at the individual numbers of cases but from the ones I see come through on the summaries and the ones that I know are being assigned are the same um, same group of vehicles and and youngsters any further questions all right thank you very much for that report appreciate it thank you uh, item two will be an update from the Parks Department regarding some summer youth programming, employment opportunities, and park safety. Mr. Marquardt, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, parks, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, commissioners and uh, committee members and city staff. Um, David Marquardt, Director of Parks and Recreation, uh, here to present on another aspect of public safety. Um, good public safety, we believe. A uh, portion of which uh, lies in good public programming. And so we wanted to uh, walk through with you today a little bit about what we've got going on for the summer months. Um, most notably, uh, the pools just opened up this last Friday, as well as our 16 uh, splash pads across the city of Grand Rapids. And as a note, uh, 16 splash pads uh, for the number of uh, individuals that live within this city is very high. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, th that number of amenities uh, uh, within this uh, great city. Um, so we've got our three pools, Briggs Pool, uh, northwest side of the city, MLK, and Richmond Park pools. Uh, each of our pools are open seven days a week, uh, seven to eight hours per day, most generally. Uh, and it's a very reasonable uh, cost uh, for families and youth to swim in our pools. And this is thanks in part to uh, the voters of Grand Rapids and their passage of the uh, millage funding in 2019 that makes this so affordable. Um, in addition, we are utilizing some of those important millage dollars to uh, run our four summer day camps. Uh, we've got four locations, Garfield Park, Joe Taylor Park, uh, MLK Park, and Roosevelt Parks. And those are Monday through Friday camps um, from the hours of 12 p.m. until 4 p.m. Number of activities that t take place here at each of those camps, uh, some summer swim lessons as well at, at those locations that have pools like MLK, um, and we serve uh, upwards of three to four hundred youth per summer, which is a really remarkable number. In addition, we're trying uh, some new things. Uh, we're in our second or third season of uh, free summer outdoor fitness series. Uh, so you've probably seen some of this in the media, social media channels. Um, we are working with a number of partners to produce uh, free outdoor fitness classes, some of which occur on the Blue Bridge in downtown parks like Rosa Park Circle, uh, Canal Park, Sixth Street Park, and up in Lookout Park uh, as well. These are great opportunities to activate our downtown spaces, bring healthy, vibrant activity uh, to these uh, really important locations across downtown. Uh, but new this year, we're starting some new kayak rentals and uh, other equipment rentals in Canal Park, uh, another great way in which to activate the River Corridor um, and some of these really important downtown spaces. So very reasonable uh, to rent a kayak for $5 uh, for a little bit of time. Uh, in addition to that, if you're not uh, interested in getting on the water, we're renting cruiser bikes and skateboards and other uh, fun equipment through our gear library um, at this key location. In addition uh, to these uh, programmatic activities, we are taking uh, security measures very seriously within the realm of parks and recreation. 
Uh, specifically within downtown and some of our larger community parks. Uh, we've got the security gates that we installed a couple of years ago in our key downtown parks. Those are operational on a daily basis. They close down those parking areas from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. Um, we've got security cameras that are now complete uh, and operational in the park locations that you see on the screen in front of you. Um, a couple of locations uh, that we did add most recently include Reservoir Park, uh, where we've been experiencing an uptick in some uh, activity uh, after hours, uh, after parks are closed. Um, in addition, we've got Roaming Night Security that we are hiring again. Um, they are now patrolling our parks from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. Uh, they really do patrol those downtown parks where we've got security cameras. Their role is really to uh, ensure that we don't have any uh, visitors within our parks uh, after uh, hours have, have closed those park spaces. In addition to park security, park uh, security cameras, we did work with the Ecliptic at Rosa Parks Circle Conservancy and Downtown Grand Rapids Incorporated to determine that um, it would be in everyone's best interest to have a dedicated maintenance staff person at Ecliptic. And so this season we've started that work. Uh, we've got one dedicated employee, Owen. Uh, if you're ever through that space, say hello to Owen. He works hard down then in that space uh, every day, eight hours a day. Uh, and you can see a difference. Uh, and, and it's uh, important to ensure that we are keeping this public piece of art uh, at its highest standard, uh, but this park space as well for all users. Uh, and then we are also uh, constant, constantly monitoring and uh, updating and ensuring that we are um, implementing the SEPTED, the crime prevention through environmental design aspects uh, through all of our park spaces. That, so that's really ensuring that lighting is not being blocked by any trees or shrubbery um, and that our pathways are clear and, and uh, not um, promoting anyone uh, the ability to hide or, or um, stake out a park location. We've got our Park Ambassador program uh, in, uh, up and running again this year as well. We've currently got 12 ambassadors on staff. Uh, they work seven days a week, six to 11 hours daily. Generally, these Park Ambassadors are roaming different park locations based on activities that we've got programmed or where we've got some of those free summer outdoor fitness classes taking place. They'll be monitoring their, those locations or helping with setup or tear down uh, and checking on restroom facilities as well if their hours uh, or their shift runs during uh, those park closure times. In addition, we are working to hire uh, some dedicated ambassador staff for Martin Luther King Park. Uh, we are currently in the hiring process right now. Those ambassador staff will be dedicated to that park specifically uh, from the hours that the pools will be open and the summer camp as well to provide an additional layer of, of eyes on that park and, and uh, security. In addition to those security measures, we are training our staff uh, very diligently. Uh, not just in the first aid and CPR aspects uh, that are required at our pool locations, but we've been working diligently with our emergency uh, operations officer, uh, Allison Feroli, in creating emergency action plans for each of our parks and each of our pools. So we've got plans in place for all of our park locations and pool locations. Our staff have been trained on the importance of those plans and how to utilize those plans. Uh, in addition, our lifeguard staff, our pool attendant staff, and camp counselors have also uh, been trained in active shooter, active assailant, customer service, and diffusing situations. Um, and this training has been led by um, folks within our Grand Rapids Police Department. So these are all really important uh, aspects. Our staff have provided very positive feedback already with these partnerships and these trainings and are looking forward to more, uh, especially as we bring on new staff, but of uh, supplementing that training that has already been done. So a lot of really great things um, from the Parks and Recreation perspective. You can always find these activities and events posted online uh, through our website and through our uh, social media channels as well, but uh, happy to entertain any questions that you may have at this point. Very good, colleagues. Uh, I just have one. Uh, thank you for this report. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the uh, park security measures. Um, in the training, uh, they, the individuals who are trained, are they trained to look for mental illness as well in the training piece? I believe GRPD has uh, uh, included that as a part of their training regimen, yes.
think that's the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your mic? Yeah. There's some the speakers, I think. All right, and some technical difficulties there, but I think we're. Uh, wasn't me. Well, wasn't me. Well, wasn't me. Oh. <laughs> All right. Any additional comments, uh, questions, uh, City Manager? Yes, and I probably should have done this before uh, Ms. Marquardt began, but we wanted to. Uh, you, you heard the uh, briefing from the police department about uh, safety and, and crime in our city and with the uh, likelihood that there is even more activity in the summer we wanted to be um, proactive in placing emphasis on prevention and the things that we can do particularly for youth and engaging them in meaningful activities so this presentation as well as the subsequent presentation you'll hear from the Grow 1000 program highlights some of the things positively that's available for, for youth to engage in the summer. So I want to thank uh, the Parks Department for um, looking at ways to expand those efforts, but also uh, to make sure that uh, they're safe um, as they're made available to the public. Very good. Mr. Fan. I would like to support that same comment that is all I important. Think we found the bad mic. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the summertime, when kids have a lot of open time. They have structured activities and also your ambassador program. Sorry. Well, he has to be here, here for the record, though. Yeah. Well, is, is it picking it up, though? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe share, maybe share the mic. <laughs> it's Mr. Fahan's mic microphone is the one that's uh, yeah. acting. Well, taking us to the road. Wanted to reinforce the comments the uh, city manager made about um, structured programs for youth in the summer. There's a lot of kids that don't have uh, jobs and it's hard to get. Uh, and so both the, the programs themselves and your ambassador program is very important uh, as there's a lot of free time. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but right now I, I just want to also mention uh, the fast response that the city and the police had to the uh, shooting at the Blue uh, Bridge and changing the policy to close that. Uh, it's very well received and uh, a terrifying kind of thing to have in your neighborhood. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. And I think we'll wrap it up here with uh, the Parks and Rec. We're going to bring... Uh, Ms. Harris to the mic for uh, some comments around uh, the 2023 Girl 1000 Youth Employment Program. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, City Commissioners and Committee members, uh, City Manager, and other City staff. Uh, my name is Shannon Harris. I am the Executive Director of Our Community's Children, and I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the office in case those that are here um, are unaware of what we do in Our Community's Children. I'll talk a little bit about the history of Grow 1000, and then I'll, um, I'll wrap it up with what we're doing this summer with uh, this Youth Employment Program. Uh, so Our Community's Children is a public-private partnership between the City of Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Public Schools, and community partners. And we exist to create programs and to initiate uh, or facilitate initiatives that better prepare young people for college, for work and life. And this slide really represents the work that we do. Uh, we have an expanded learning opportunities network of out-of-school time providers. So out-of-school time includes before school, after school, and summer programming. Um, and so we have providers that really work to ensure that young people have access to those programs. We also have a direct service program called the Mayor's Youth Council. Uh, and that is a program for young people in uh, high school to learn about the functions of city government uh, in a school year. And so they meet with the mayor every uh, month. They meet with their city commissioners. And their culminating event is Kids Week, uh, where young people come to City Hall to give uh, voice to issues uh, that impact them. We also have a post-secondary initiative. It's a system building initiative where we are uh, ensuring that young people have the resources that they need to get to and through college with a hyper focus on first generation students, students of color, and GRPS graduates, and then we have our Youth Employment Initiative. So we actually have two programs uh, within our Youth Employment Initiative. One uh, is the Grow 1000 program, which I'll talk a little bit about 
in a couple minutes, but we also have the Grow 1000 Academy, which is a spinoff of that program for 18 to 24 year olds uh, that live in a neighborhood of focus and it's a longer term employment opportunity. And these young people receive about 40 hours of pre-employment training, and then that makes them eligible for a job. And we actually have a, a, Grow, a Grow 1000 Academy a participant in the room who is working for the executive offices. And so she graduated from our academy this, uh, this spring and is now working in the executive offices for about four months. Um, but yes, yes, yeah, stand up, Ami. Congratulations on your achievement for that. And then we have the Grow 1000 program. So uh, the Grow 1000 program uh, started in 2020 in the uh, middle of the pandemic. And it was a directive from uh, our city manager, Dr. Mark Washington, to create a program and opportunities for young people during a time when everything was so uncertain. Everything was closed, but we wanted to see something positive happen for young people. Um, so it's really, a, this uh, in 2020 was a, a rapid response uh, to that directive um, to hire young people to work in a variety of capacities around the city. Um, it was also a response to obviously the, the pandemic, but also ongoing racial injustices and the economic disparities that happened. But after the first year, we realized we didn't want this just to be a, a one-off uh, or just a moment. We wanted it to be more of a movement and provide pathways for uh, young people um, to explore careers and to explore um, that college is possible um, after um, secondary uh, school. So uh, we've had the uh, uh, Grow 1000 program since 2020. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the numbers um, since 2020. So we affectionately call our participants growers. So in 2020, we uh, employed 350 young people. Uh, in 2021, the, 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 the community, uh, the world opened up a little bit more. So there were a little bit more opportunities uh, for young people to participate um, in um, uh, out of school time uh, activities. So in 2021, we had 286 young people and then last year, 184. The majority of our young people, about 75% of our young people that participate in Grow 1000 every summer are under the age of 18. So most of them, this is their first official job. Um, uh, but we do have young people, about 20%, 25% that are over the age of 18 that participate. Uh, they self-identify um, around uh, gender, as you can see right there on the chart. Um, and then uh, about 70%, uh, a little over 70, 73% identify themselves as being part of the BIPOC community. And around 80% are residents of Grand Rapids. And so uh, this year, we've uh, added some, um, some tweaks, some adaptations to uh, this year's program. Uh, the majority of the work that is done in this program is done in-house this year, uh, from program design to reporting. Uh, we also recruit young people uh, through uh, GRPS and through our community-based organizations, our out-of-school time uh, providers. Um, we also do all of the application and onboarding through our HR department. Uh, we do uh, in-person orientations this year. Uh, we, we've done the matching process this year. This is an opportunity for young people um, age 15 to 24 to have a uh, six-week employment experience. This year, we've also added some professional development uh, that I'll talk about shortly. We're doing all the triaging, and starting next week, we're doing site visits to ensure goodness of fit. We are continuing the mentorship component of this program, so we uh, got out an RFQ. Uh, we had three uh, to respond to that, and we've hired one called Meaning meaning in colors, um, and the CEO is Ariana uh, uh, Ho uh, Hogan. And so she has um, uh, recruited mentors uh, to walk alongside our young people who have identified themselves as wanting a mentor to ensure goodness of fit and to talk about conflict resolution uh, during their, their employment experience, um, to talk about workplace etiquette and you know those unwritten rules in the workplace. Uh, we also have uh, an evaluation, so we evaluate our young people three times during this program after the first week. So we started yesterday was the first day. And so we'll survey them uh, on Friday and then we'll survey, survey them uh, midway through. And then at the end, we also survey our employer uh, participants. We'll have a celebration on the last day, which is July 21st. So everyone is welcome. Uh, we will be here in the chambers and on the plaza. Uh, we invoice our uh, employers uh, at the end of the experience. So the city of Grand Rapids is the employer of record. 
So all of our growers are City of Grand Rapids employees, uh, but our participating uh, uh, employers receive an invoice at the end uh, to cover the cost of their wages. And then uh, we always do reporting. So if you go on Our Communities Children's website, which is Our Communities with the YS, Possessive.com, and go to our publications tab, you'll see all of our reports from uh, the first year um, until last year. All right, so uh, right now, um, these are the numbers that we have for this year. We had 341 applications, unique applications. We have placed 184 growers uh, at 44 uh, employers, uh, so it includes city departments. Uh, we had two in-person payroll tutorials, so this is a little bit different uh, this year in that we provided opportunities for young people that needed help with their onboarding paperwork um, to receive that onboard paperwork uh, from our payroll department HR department. We've had three in-person orientations, uh, and that is those orientations are paid. We've had one virtual uh, orientation, one in-person employer orientation, and then we'll have six Grow Further Fridays, which is our uh, PD series, which is also paid. Uh, the matching requirements uh, include uh, completing the application, completing their onboarding documentation, and pre-employment training, but we also match them with their career interests, which they've uh, indicated on their uh, their uh, application. We also have in-person, virtual, and hybrid uh, opportunities. Uh, we have to consider the age preferences and restrictions of some of the jobs that are available. And then we try to match young people um, to opportunities that are close to their, um, their residents. So the schedule for our growers, they work 20 hours a week for six weeks, starting yesterday, ending uh, July 21st. They work a total of 120 hours. We do pay them for their orientation. Uh, they do get paid for their Grow for their Fridays professional development. So we've listened to our young people through our surveying uh, over the last three years, as well as our employers, about some of the... Um, pre-employment and post-employment and really during employment uh, uh, trainings that are necessary for success. So we are um, scheduling uh, these Grow for the Fridays, obviously on Fridays, every Friday starting this Friday in the city commission chambers from nine to noon. Um, so we are covering topics from financial literacy. So once they get that first paycheck, what should they do with that first paycheck to um, really celebrating uh, the achievements uh, that are happening on the job with growers of greatness. And so not only is my staff uh, uh, participating in the facilitation of these Grow Further Fridays, but we also hire experts in the field to do, do the same. So some of the outcomes, uh, we would like to see 80% of our growers work at least 80 uh, to 120 hours. You know this is the summer. We're competing against a lot of different things. Um, some of our growers have uh, second jobs. Some of them are in um, summer school. Um, some of them are taking classes. Some are going on vacation. So uh, we would like to see at least 80% of our growers work 80 to uh, 120 hours. 80% attend our GFF, Grow Further Fridays. We want 70% through surveying to say that uh, Grow 1000 met their expectations. 70% um, we want them to be satisfied with their workplace match. And we want at least 70% to, to gain or enhance a skill during this time. I want to thank my staff. So it's uh, uh, it takes a mighty team. Uh, so we've got program coordinators. We've got staff that is in our, in our T2C studio, which is our place-based response to degree attainment rate. So they'll come every Friday and talk a a little bit about how college is possible. And then we've got our interns uh, that are instrumental in getting the work done, but also other city departments. Of course, it's just not just uh, OCC. It's several other departments that ensure that this program is successful. And then uh, any questions? Uh, I can entertain any questions, but we also have a, a, a frequently asked questions uh, page on the city's website for those employers as well as uh, employees that are going through the Grow 1000 program. Very good. Colleagues, any questions for Ms. Harris? So from the 300, I mean, it looks it looks like an awesome program. Like and. I think what just caught my attention is the number of applicants that it sounds like aren't able to be placed. Um, what what is that? What is the reason that we 
couldn't place everybody or what happens to those people? Yeah, so in any youth development program, you always have to, number one, recruit twice as many uh, young people that you want to be in the program. But for this specific case is that we do have young people that fill out an application, but for whatever reason, they don't fill out the onboarding process. So with Grow 1000, we don't um, require them to interview for jobs, but we do require them to fill out that pre-employment paperwork, and that's um, because they're they're, they're city employees. Um, so this year we have, uh, as I mentioned in a, in a previous slide, we provided some tutorials of how to do that. Um, but, you know, there, there are just some that just won't do it. And unfortunately, they, we have to have that done before they are placed. So, so for just clarification, we have yet to reject an applicant to the program as disqualifying them. Other than age, perhaps. Yeah, that's correct. So if they fill out the application, they fill out their onboarding paperwork, they're matched, they're in the program. Okay. Mr. Cal? <clears throat> Excellent report. Um, and nice program. I I've, wasn't aware you were doing all this stuff, so that's pretty cool. But I do have a couple of questions. There seems to be a couple of partners, to me, absent. And one is uh, public schools. And, yes. and what about trade unions? They offer all kinds of apprentice programs and mm -hmm. I just... Yep, so our community children is a partnership between the city and the school, so we already have the, you know, that, that foundation there. GRPS uh, is very instrumental in ensuring that their students are aware of the program, um, so there is constant communication that comes from the city, my office, et cetera, to ensure those GRPS students apply. Um, so I would say every year, on average, 25 to 30 percent identify as being a GRPS student. And as far as the other, um, like the trades, so we've got 44 um, unique employers, and some of those are in, in skilled trades. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for the report. I appreciate right, your you. work. Um, before we conclude the uh, meeting, I do think, uh, you know, at the last public safety meeting, uh, we made some re uh, requests for some ordinance updates, uh, which we discussed this morning uh, at our city commission uh, meeting uh, and, uh, and uh, scheduled a public hearing uh, based on some ordinances that the legal department uh, had developed. And I uh, just wondered maybe if uh, Deputy Chief Barons might want to just come on and give a brief synopsis back to the committee about what was uh, what was presented just, uh, just for the uh, posterity of this committee and uh, the members that weren't in attendance at uh, this morning's commission meeting. Sure, happy to do so. So um, we did present um, both the very high flyover of some of the information that you all received over the course of several months. So I attempted to encapsulate on one slide sort of the program improvements and resource um, improvements and system improvement work that you all heard about over a couple months from both city staff and our partners at the Continuum of Care and Housing Kent. Uh, and then we got right into the recommendations recommendation of this committee from last month, which was to explore some additional regulatory approaches. So we um, did carry forward the message that this is sort of a comprehensive look, so not just focusing in on regulatory tools, but we did present that information about investments and resources and facilities that also can help folks that uh, for whom the criminal justice system is not the right fit for addressing what's going on. Um, so we did, we did make that point, um, but did uh, carry forward your recommendation about looking at some additional regulatory tools. Um, then we talked about those two ordinances in particular that had been developed by the city attorney's office in consultation with a number of our other city departments um, about those two points. So um, there were recommendations from this group to help uh, fill some gaps with respect to personal property in public uh, rights of way and on public parks and other public land. Uh, and so we had the deputy uh, city attorney describing in more legal detail about uh, what ordinance was brought forward, but uh, there is a proposed amendment to the nuisance provisions of the city code. So um, focused on both clarifying some definitions around property, personal property, all of those things we need to operationalize that, um, and then talking about how we would uh, focus on the ability to impound property or abate the nu nuisance um, in legal terms.
terms, where folks are storing property on personal property in public areas um, in ways that are in excess of what the the code would allow. Um, and then we talked about how we would ensure the due process rights of those uh, whose property was implicated by both pre-notice in some circumstances so that before we take the property, we let you know if you don't modify what you're doing, we're going to have to seize this property or impound this property. Um, or um, certain circumstances where that pre-notice is not practical, we can still impound. And then for all circumstances, we have to let folks know if that was property um, of value, where we are going to store it and how they go about getting their property back, much like if your car's towed, you get information about how to make that happen, right? Um, so we talked about that. Um, and then the second uh, ordinance was really encapsulating some direction from this committee about looking at um, circumstances where folks might feel harassed or intimidated while they're involved in some sort of commercial transaction. Um, city attorney's office was um, very good at explaining this kind of captive audience idea. So uh, courts have allowed for cities to uh, regulate behavior when, when someone's sort of a captive audience and, and can't get away from you, um, defining behavior that can make that person feel intimidated or harassed to, to do something or perform some function or uh, do some other thing. So uh, went over that in detail with the commission as well. And all of that was uh, to support the commission setting a public hearing on both of those ordinances so that uh, the commission did agree to do that. And those public hearings would be on July 11th. Thank you very much for that update. Uh, just turn to my colleagues. Any, any questions? Just the, we can get you copies of the ordinances too so you can review them if you have any additional questions. All right, city manager. All right, with with what's that? Oh, very good, sir. I forgot about that. So uh, one uh, topic of discussion that I, I know myself and I haven't even talked to either of my colleagues about this yet is uh, I get a lot of complaints about uh, the deer population in the city of Grand Rapids. Like a lot of complaints about it. Uh, and so I, I think last year I talked to uh, deputy. Attorney Strom had done some initial research on that, and I'm just wondering if maybe we could uh, reach out to our friends at the Department of Natural Resources and maybe get a presentation on what uh, what control mechanisms might be available. I mean, I also wonder about uh, Mr. Hurt uh, if he can get us some data about how many. Uh, you know, I, I like to I tell people all the time the only natural predators for deer in the city of Grand Rapids are cars. So just I imagine his staff is uh, picking up quite a few dead animals on the road. Uh, you know, it's 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 a, it's a traffic safety issue. It's a, you know, it's a sanitation and safe, uh, health issue, and it's a destruction of personal proper property issue that seems to be happening a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love deer. I like deer. I know a lot about deer, but I also know that they're in lots of yards. I had one in my yard the other day with a missing leg. Uh, it's completely wandering around on three legs. So I know that they're, you know, they're suffering in some regards, too, because they're getting hit by cars in a, in a urban environment. So it's a, it's a lot, of, you know, talking to our... Uh, Folks that like Blandford Nature Center, there's a, a, a very large deer population. They're trying to bring back a natural, uh, you know, midwestern prairie, and it's overrun with deer that are eating all the trees that you know. You, the city just planted all those beautiful trees with the daylighting of uh, of uh, the Indian Mill Creek, and uh, I imagine a lot of them got ate over the winter. So it's just you know, there's a balance that needs to be struck. And is, is there are there mechanisms in place to be able to help us potentially deal with those uh, those issues? So. Well, uh, we certainly can uh, bring back for future discussions some of the efforts around our urban wildlife management and uh, partner with uh, state and, and the county as well and, um, and um, get some data about our experience here in traffic and as well as calls for service. So we're, we're happy to bring back that at a future meeting. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kettle. Um, I do have some experience in this from my time in the house. Um, so I did contact DNR back then. DNR said, we don't do that. Um, there's a lot of hazards involved with this stuff. And they said, well, what you got to do is call your police department and they'll go out and shoot them. <laughs> so I thought, well, wow, that's kind of rough in the city, you know. And they said, well, you can't really get, capture them. They'll die immediately if you try to net them. So... Yeah, high-strung little characters, and yes, I do have them in my yard. 
my wife doesn't like them. So, but yeah, that's that was the response I got. So, just <laughs> Mr. Manager, just for the public, please do not call the police department <laughs> to come and. Th th this is not what we do in Grand Rapids. Uh, just uh, do call three one one if you have a service request. It's in the city right away. We will come and make sure we address it. But what we don't do is uh, do any kind of effort on private property. Very good. Any additional comments or questions? All right. Hearing none, we'll adjourn this meeting at one sixteen. Thank you.